Turkey says it's open to Sweden joining NATO as long as Europe first opens its mind to the idea of embracing their long-standing bid to join the European Union. We asked Prabir Pukaisa what this means for global politics and how Turkey and also countries like India, Brazil and South Africa find themselves in a more independent space with regard to international relations in an increasingly multipolar world. And in India, patients' rights groups are pleading with the federal government to ease the entry of generic biosimilar drugs into the market with a view to significantly reduce the cost as well as access to medication for patients dealing with different cancers and other rare diseases. Why, when the WHO has released new guidelines on biosimilars, is India lagging behind on a policy front? And in Canada, the port workers' strike continues, but there is little understanding of what is going on beyond business news outlets reporting on the impact on the supply chain and the losses to big companies. Why are dock workers fighting not just for a pay hike, but for a better understanding of the very future of their industry? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief, coming to you as always from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani, and first up on the show, uh, should Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's latest statement, uh, just the day before the big NATO summit kicked off in the Lithuanian capital Vilnius, be viewed as a U-turn? Or is the Turkish leader taking a pragmatic approach towards balancing NATO politics with Turkey's own aspirations towards Europe? Prabhi Pukasta is NewsClick's editor-in-chief and he joins us in studio to discuss some of the uh, important aspects, actually, of what's going on on the diplomatic front. Keeping up our coverage, Prabir, of, of the uh, NATO summit, uh, uh, one point we didn't cover in our previous conversation was uh, Turkey's sort of stand on admitting Sweden uh, into full membership. Uh, and there's been a U-turn there. Uh, how do you look at uh, sort of post-election Erdogan and uh, his position having uh, shifted uh, as far as this negotiation is concerned? Well, it does seem that Erdogan wants to at least try and repair some of the relations he had uh, in, damaged, shall we say, the last few years. Mm. So the question of NATO, of course, which you have asked, but also on the question, for instance, of letting the people who are, uh, you know, captured in Mariupol, and he has let some of these people go. And they were essentially let uh, to be freed on the condition that they are interned in Turkey and they don't come back to Ukraine. Mm. So that's the agreement they seem to have had with Russia. So they seem to have also uh, gone back on that. Mm. Uh, and there seems to be also some softening regarding what you are saying, mm. uh, allowing Sweden to join NATO. NATO operates by the fact that even if one member says no, it's not possible to take the, uh, that country in. So they have been saying that Sweden's relationship uh, with protecting certain PKK members, uh, the Kurdish fighty, which is a party which is fighting against uh, Turkey mm. and wants a separate Kurdistan. So, so they, that part of it, that they, they seem to have either solved or weakened. Mm. Now, there is also it's also true that Sweden has launched some cases against some of the PKK people in Sweden. Mm. So is it because of that? Is it something else? We don't know. Mm. But what is interesting is while they have withdrawn their objection to Sweden, mm. but they have put new conditions mm. to the European Union, which has nothing to do with NATO officially. Yeah. Of course, we know the same countries play the major role. The United States really decides both mm. at the moment. <laughs> They're the big bosses of European Union as well. So they have said, if the European Union allows Turkey to join, and he has said that we have waited 50 years for this, mm. and uh, uh, then we shall we shall allow Turkey to join. Uh, sorry, we shall rephrase Sweden. it. So that we have waited 50 years to join the European Union yeah. or join Europe rather than yeah, the European yeah, Union. Yeah. But if we are allowed to join the European Union, then we will withdraw our objections to Sweden's joining NATO. Whether it is precondition, mm. whether it's a, a gentleman's agreement mm. or a quid pro quo kind of thing, mm. we don't know as of now. Mm. And Erdogan, as you know, is never that clear. I yeah. think he wants yeah. to keep his bargaining position yeah. and possibility of withdrawal from that position also if he wants. Mm. So all these flexibilities are there, mm. but it is possible that uh, the kind of relationship that Erdogan or Turkey had 
with the West, which really had been damaged significantly, yeah. particularly because Turkey is wanting to play an independent hand mm. in the, what is called by the European Union or the European countries as the Near East. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have a geographical point of view, which is as if the whole world is being looked the toward <laughs> the center of the universe, which for them is Europe. So if we look at that, then it does seem that they are uh, warming up to Erdogan. Erdogan is warming up to European Union. Mm. It, it is also, we have also to see what is the bargaining it does with Russia, mm. because there is a trade deal, the oil, the uh, deal of the fertilizers and food exports. And Turkey is again a very important player there, yeah. because it has really to take place through the waterways which Turkey controls yeah. out of the Black Sea. Mm. So all of this is at the moment in the mix. Mm. And there is also another agreement which is in the mix, which is what does Russia and Turkey decide about Syria and those areas of Syria which are officially not controlled by Turkey but is actually controlled mm. by Turkey. Mm. And they are with some of the Islamist forces mm. which are protected by Turkey. Mm. So I think a lot of unresolved issues over there. But let's also be clear, Erdogan has not said Sweden can join, can join. NATO. Yep. I withdraw my objections, period. Mm. He has said a conditional if. yes mm. and that condition is what European Union has to fulfill and not NATO. Mm. So I think I will say at the moment, the looking glass is not still clear mm. what the future holds. Mm. So I think we'll have to see how this plays out. Yes, it is a change. Is it a new spin to the old uh, decision or is it a actually change of position? This is what we have to see. Uh, from uh, the perspective of the uh, adversaries in the current conflict, uh, Prabir, and you can look at it as Ukraine or Ukraine and the European Union on, on the one side. Uh, Turkey has, like you were saying, been able to at least have some conversations with both sides. Uh, how will this kind of affect that position, uh, both vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, the European side and the Russian side? I think we are seeing a change in the world in which certain flexibilities for countries like Turkey even countries like India, India. are opening out, yeah. which means that the world in two blocks is not the way it is now operating. Mm. And therefore, a lot of countries are willing to play a role which gives them a more flexibility, if you will, more bargaining power, if you will, mm. or as the, the, the Europeans and the Americans used to say, play both sides of the street, which yeah. is what they talked about, the non-line movement. Mm. But really what it means is the stability of blocks are no longer there. Mm. At the edges, they are fraying. Mm. So core of this block mm. is NATO European Union. Mm. Okay, mm. Turkey is not a core member today of NATO yeah. because it, it's playing an independent hand, whether it was Syria, whether it's West Asia, whether it's the Black Sea, mm. they are playing an independent Turkish hand. Mm. On economic matters, they are even more uh, independent. independent of mm. all of this. So I think what is happening, whether we have a Saudi Arabia in West Asia or we have a Turkey in what the Europe calls the Near East, yeah. okay, the Anatolian <laughs> Plateau, mm. I think these are all playing a relatively more flexible hand than what they had earlier. Mm. And the if the hegemonic role that the U.S. was playing, mm. if that weakens, which it is at the moment, and the Russian-Ukraine war, the Ukraine war and the Russia-NATO war to be mm. exact, mm. that I think is creating much more fissures in the world and also flexibilities for countries across the globe. And I think that is something which is new that we are seeing. And it gives powers like Turkey, powers like India, powers like Brazil, and also for countries like South Africa, for instance, yeah. uh, a lot more flexibility in their international relationships than it was there earlier. Mm. So both the weakening of the US hegemony, mm. the fact that the NATO has found itself not able to break Russia, yeah. the fact that the European Union and the United States and the UK put together mm. has not been able to sink the Russian economy mm. means there is an opening out. And let's face it, 
today. Uh, if you take, for instance, what would be called the BRICS, yeah. the BRICS countries' GDP is larger than that of the G7, G7 if mm. you take purchasing power parity into mm. account. And if you take even the two largest countries in this block, which mm. is India, India and China. China, then you will see it's bigger than G5 in terms of the economies that we are talking about. Mm. So there is a global shift in economic power. What it means for the strategic set of forces to play out, mm. this is something which is at the moment shifting yeah. and it is changing. And I think what we are seeing is countries like Turkey to be able to assert a bigger or play a bigger hand mm. than what they would have otherwise been able to do. And these are the changes we are seeing. It doesn't mean you're going to get alignment with yeah, one yeah. side or the other. Yeah. And I think all of, them want to play, not, yeah. uh, all of them want to play a more independent uh, role. role. And yeah. I think they, therefore, this is where the politics of the future uh, is going to be relatively more unstable, more mm. shifting alliances, mm. and therefore more difficult to predict. predict. And I yeah. think that's the phase that we are entering into now. All right. Thank you very much for that, Prabir. Next up, nine patients' rights groups in India have written a joint letter to the federal government urging it to remove barriers in the production of biosimilars, which are generic, low-cost versions of medicines made from proteins, sugars, or other biologically occurring molecules. This will greatly reduce the cost of these medicines uh, that are widely used to treat a range of cancers and other ailments, including arthritis and irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, currently, without the generic version of these drugs being available in country, accessibility is extremely limited given the prohibiting, prohibitive pricing of these medications which are imposed by innovator companies and Big Pharma. Jutsna Singh of the People's Health Movement is here to give us a full picture on this very important story that actually impacts millions of patients across the country. Uh, Jotsa, thanks for joining us on Daily Debrief. Uh, important story uh, today that we're discussing. Uh, if it's relevant, tell us who these patients' rights groups are, but more importantly, uh, what is the content of uh, the appeal that they've made to the central government? Yeah, so uh, there are nine uh, organizations who have written to the government of India, its various departments and ministries, uh, asking for certain changes in uh, guidelines about uh, some of the latest medicines. Uh, which can impact uh, prices uh, for medicines of cancers, rare diseases, and many others uh, to a great extent. Mm. Uh, and these organizations uh, um, uh, are uh, from across many diseases and uh, conditions. Uh, the Delhi Network of Positive People, which is a prominent uh, organization of uh, people living with HIV. Uh, there is also a network of various people, academicians, doctors, uh, and NGOs, which is called a uh, working group on access to medicines and treatment. Uh, they are also a part of it. Then Cancer AIDS Association. There are many, many organizations sure. who uh, sign rare diseases groups, of course. Uh, so the thing is, the uh, at the core of the matter is, um, so the way we have known medicines uh, traditionally, they are a small molecules. So all of your uh, paracetamols and analgesics and antibiotics, they're essentially chemical products which are being uh, this, uh, produced in the labs uh, and then the medicines uh, which we can consume are made out of them, right? Mm. Uh, but over the past couple of decades, a, a completely new technology has uh, taken over, which is, uh, and the, those are called the biologics, mm. which are actually biological materials. In other words, things that exist in the nature. So right. they can come. Uh, they are proteins, which they can come from the plants, they can come from certain human cells also, uh, and various such uh, natural material. Now, these are really big molecules. Like, uh, 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 it's nowhere compared to small molecules. Mm. So uh, initially, when one uh, innovative company, uh, the company which uh, has researched and come up with a new uh, molecule of this sort, uh, biologic as we call them, uh, so once they produce met, uh, uh, that new drug and they bring it to the market, they obviously would have patents on it. And that has been the case with the smaller molecules also. However, as soon as the patent on a medicine generally gets over, our understanding is that uh, the generic manufacturers would be able to start producing them and the prices will come down. Mm. That 
is not happening in the case of biologics because of the requirements uh, uh, in India. Uh, so uh, uh, apart from what we have known in a smaller molecules, the way you have to establish uh, a generic manufacturer has to establish that their medicine is similar to the original uh, yeah, yeah. medicine. In, in addition to that, in biologic, uh, when a biosimilar is produced, which is the generic version of a original biologic, which they are called biosimilars, mm. they have to also produce uh, an, uh, animal studies and go through uh, a part of clinical studies where they have to show that their product is quite similar to the original product. Now, mm. there are multiple problems with it. Uh, one that makes the entire, this becomes a huge barrier. Mm. Uh, because it is very cost intensive, it takes a lot of money, uh, okay. a lot of money goes into it, a lot of time goes into it, and that becomes a problem for the generic manufacturers to actually start producing these medicines. Uh, so this letter by uh, these uh, groups, uh, access to medicine groups, it basically is saying that uh, the government... Remove of some of these barriers, may, may make life easier for uh, generic manufacturers, because... Also, presumably, those generic manufacturers, uh, Josna, are surviving on relatively smaller margins and therefore don't have the kind of uh, capital to invest in long uh, processes like this. Uh, what is the current policy framework and is it just a case of uh, the government's policies in various departments not having come up to speed with best practices or established practices from around the world? Or is it something that is critical to ensuring uh, patient safety in this sense? So both. One, yeah, uh, because uh, in uh, so Indian guidelines came up, came out uh, or were adopted in 2016. Uh, but in 2021, the UK guidelines uh, were amended. And in UK, you do not require animal testing and uh, comparative uh, studies. Right. Uh, in, WHO last year in 2022 changed its guidelines and is saying that you can uh, do away with these two clauses, the main clauses. Uh, so the government of India should also do away with that. You have UK doing it, US has done it, Canada has done it, uh, European Union uh, is also, has also done it. So uh, all the established medical agencies have, uh, regulatory agencies have pretty much done it. Mm. WHO is not running the same. The problem is obviously uh, the innovator companies, mm. the Roches, the Pfizer, mm. the Glexus, Smith clients, uh, because uh, they want to maintain monopoly in the market for as long as possible. And this has become one of the ways for them to maintain monopoly, right? Because uh, earlier it was only patents. And yeah. now I think even after the patent is over, they get a very good margin, many years. Uh, even if a generic manufacturer is ready to invest because it takes years to finish all those studies because you have to pretty much do a, a, a lot of things again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so it is a lot of time and plus investment as you have correctly pointed out which the generic manufacturers may not have that much of money. So they retain their market monopoly for a longer time. And I think this is one thing which uh, is to be fought apart from asking the government to do it. So. Your, uh, your fight is at both the levels. Both uh, levels. And asking the the big pharma to say that do not push, you already earn enough money through patents. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah <laughs> enough of a chunk, I think, of of, uh, of the pie goes anyway to big pharma. Uh, if you can just quickly, uh, Josna, put it in some numbers for us. Uh, what are the kind of numbers of patients who would benefit from the removal of these kind of barriers? Uh, and also, what would be the cost differential on average? Let's say if you or I are a patient of uh, or, or uh, suffering from uh, one of these rare diseases, if we are spending today 100 units of whatever currency, how much would it come down to if some of these barriers are removed? Yeah. Uh, so, so just to give a sense of what are we talking about, for example, there is a molecule uh, and a biologic called pembrolizumab. Now, this is a cancer medicine, and it actually cures multiple types of cancers. The cancer of lungs, cancer of neck and head, uh, uh, different types of breast cancer, cervical cancer, all mm. of these. Mm. And if you know, I mean, cervical cancer and breast cancer are among the top killers in yeah. India. Uh, uh, and the government is really uh, keeps saying that they're really worried about it. Now, one vial of this biologic currently is costing rupees 2 lakh, actually a little bit more than that. 
and uh, you have to take that for one and a half to two years uh, and the cost comes to something like 60 to 70 or even more lakhs uh, for a lot of patients. Wow. Um, so that is the amount we are talking about. And right. usually what we have seen is that uh, the production cost is less than 10%. That, that's So just to put it for our international viewers, that's about, uh, if I'm not wrong, around 70,000 uh, euro. It will be, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it is, it is, it is that costly. Um, and uh, the, I mean, and just to give a sense that uh, an average Indian's uh, 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 monthly income is something to eight to 10,000 rupees. And we are talking about six to 70 lakh uh, yeah. rupees for a treatment. That's uh, 7 million rupees, yeah. It would be, yes. Yeah. So th th that is what we are talking about. And generally what we have seen uh, always that the cost of production is less than 10% of what the cost of medicine is. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, it is the entire margin actually goes to the uh, company which is uh, producing the medicine. Um, so generic companies, once they come into the market, they do reduce the prices to a very, very great extent. Mm. We've had instances where the prices uh, came down to 5 to 6% of oh. the original cost. Oh. Uh, so that is what we expect can happen in this field yeah. also. It's just that it is a relatively new field. Um, mm. as, as, as we know that uh, because... Uh, uh, India has a huge capacity to produce these medicines and our uh, guidelines do not support generic manufacturing at the moment. Uh, so the cost for the manufacturers will also remain high at the moment. Uh, but if this is done, we can really produce these uh, uh, medicines at PMAX cost and it will uh, be really good for the patient. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks very much for that, uh, Joseph. That's all the time we have. Thanks very much for but giving us a pretty full picture of what's happening on this front. And we'll catch up with you very soon again on Daily Debrief. And finally, 7,500 or so dock workers on the western seaboard of Canada have been striking for 10 days. And the federal government has now entered the picture, uh, saying it will play mediator in a dispute over wages, work conditions and the future of the ports. A labor-intensive line of work where technology is playing a growing role, uh, but discourse is sadly lacking. Uh, People's Dispatch's Anish uh, covers the region and joins us now with insights on a part of the story that has been virtually ignored. Why workers and their unions have been forced into this extreme measure. Anish, a common theme that we see when uh, it comes to reportage of uh, these kind of industrial actions uh, that happen on a large scale, it generally tends to be from business uh, sort of publications and looking at it from the angle of how it will affect supply chains and it will lead to inflation, etc., etc. Um, but the aspect that unions uh, try to sort of take all measures before resorting to this sort of strike action is never fully uh, developed as, as part of that narrative. And, and a strike is essentially a last resort. Uh, and this is another case in which we're hearing very similar kind of or looking at very similar coverage from Canada of the ongoing uh, dock workers uh, agitation. Uh, tell us about how firstly the scale of, of this action and, and give us a little bit of perspective on why workers have been pushed into uh, taking this extreme course of action. Yeah, so uh, as you quite rightly pointed out, it's uh, the coverage is quite skewed. Uh, if you even look at some of the recent reports, I mean, apart from the day one, of the strike, the reports from day one of the strike, which basically in included some parts of the demands, a very concise part of the demands uh, that the workers and the trade unions had actually uh, uh, put out uh, as part of the strike. Uh, you really see nothing on from the workers' perspective or the trade unions' perspective at this point in time. Uh, right now, it's basically just how many millions of dollars, something like 300 millions of dollars a day is being estimated as to have been lost because of the strike. Uh, but uh, there has been no uh, mention of how many months, uh, like there, it's, uh, this, uh, these negotiations have been going on for months actually. And uh, uh, it began very early this year. And the fact that there has been no resolution so far, and the fact that the company has been, uh, the employers especially, 
uh, have been uh, quite adamant at uh, you know at their uh, position, especially in terms of uh, contracting out, which is something that has uh, attracted a significant attention in this current set of strikes uh, that we see on the western coast of Canada. Uh, it's basically something that they are not uh, attending to. There is also nothing like one of the significant factors about the strike is that it is focused significantly on uh, uh, on automation and how that is going to affect uh, j- current jobs. Uh, jobs and also uh, jobs for the future Absolutely. generation. And that is something that uh, that is that should be part of the conversation with all this talk of AI and everything, all this talk of technological leap forward that uh, you know all the mainstream media has been talking about. But there has been no talk about how that is going to affect uh, the workforce, especially uh, employment and how it is going to even affect those who are currently employed. Mm. And that is uh, mm. something that the workers have been trying to uh, bring light attention to. And that is something that they do not, they do not want to discuss, especially the current coverage. And that is very significant. Uh, And it also kind of shows how things work. Because if you see right now, uh, uh, on uh, Tuesday, uh, the government, the federal government has already intervened and will be mediating the talks now. And that pretty much is what we've seen before. We've seen, we have covered the another uh, set of strikes in the eastern coast of Canada earlier this year. Uh, and in that, uh, the government eventually created, uh, imposed uh, a contract uh, and imposed it by law, actually, by legislation, by means of legislation, pretty much shutting down the strike altogether without any consent from the trade unions. And that is pretty much uh, where the uh, where the current set of negotiations which the government is mediating is headed to. And that is the direction that they're taking, which is also not going to be talked about. Uh, at, at, the, uh, at this time, what we are seeing is a very skewed coverage that is uh, that it's not just anti-worker, it's just completely non-worker. There's no uh, perspective from trade unions at the moment. And that is the very jarring aspect of the current set of strikes that we're seeing. Mm. So, so bring us uh, a little bit of that perspective, uh, Anish, how many uh, workers and families are being affected uh, by the lack of movement on this negotiation and and uh, what are the sort of what is the industry uh, talking about in terms of uh, what lies ahead uh, because this is presumably again the negotiations not based on uh, like a six month or or one year but a slightly longer term discussion yeah so uh, currently there are about 7000 or more uh, workers right now on strike, and this is pretty much what we're looking at is about 30 ports uh, across the west coast of Canada. And this uh, this pretty much basically shuts down uh, the entire uh, west coast. Uh, and the west coast is quite important for Canada because it's, uh, especially with the port of Vancouver there, uh, which is considered as the gateway to the east, and the mm. east being uh, east of Asia. And Asia is essentially, and so uh, a lot of uh, consumer products uh, that pretty much travel from there, and also from you know the west coast of the United States, uh, are kind of uh, stuck, and they do not have a place to go for. And this is something that uh, pretty much the workers understand the very uh, you know the need, their uh, importance in this entire process as well. So we are also seeing some level of solidarity from workers on the U.S. Uh, West Coast. That is that should also be uh, pointed out. We have seen mm-hmm. uh, unions in the Californian ports uh, talking about uh, the fact that they will not be, uh, you know, undocking any of the ships that are, uh, you know, cargo ships that are uh, redirected from away from uh, the West Coast at the mm-hmm. current moment when the strike is going on. So that clearly shows a very uh, significant level of, uh, you know, worker solidarity because this is, these are pretty much the same struggles that they are Absolutely, going through. conditions the same. must be pretty much the, the same exactly. down the coast. Yeah. Exactly. And the, and as I said, like these are probably one of the first strikes that are actually talking about automation in a, uh, you know, labor intensive industry. And that's, uh, that is something that really needs to be talked about, that really needs to be addressed. And they are actually uh, looking forward to in, uh, having that, like a resolution of that in their contracts. And that is something that is going to be groundbreaking if it actually happens. But And this will ag- actually set a, a precedent for everybody, not just in Canada, but also the, uh, the whole of the North American and maybe beyond that. 
And so these factors are definitely something that is being, uh, you know, repressed. It's apart from wage hikes, which is like the common theme at this moment of because course, yeah. of uh, the spiraling cost of living. These are facts. Uh, these are uh, facts that are going to affect a future uh, working class at the uh, even, and that is something that these workers are right now trying to address. And the fact that they do not, there is. You know, it's quite a kind of sad that there is little coverage on that, those aspects of it. There is little investigation of how uh, how much it is going to be affected. Like, well, we do not really know the kind of estimates, uh, uh, an estimated job loss that automation is going to bring into industries like these. We're talking about IT and other stuff, but we do not know how labor intensive industries will be affected, mm. especially uh, uh, places like the ports. So these are things that that uh, that needs to be highlighted, but obviously it is not. And it's, that is the sad part of this entire uh, situation right now. Right. Uh, thanks very much for bringing that perspective in, uh, an important one. And, and also uh, one that can, I guess, then uh, connect dots between various kinds of uh, action that workers are taking across industries uh, around the world at this point and also because we don't know is why uh, these uh, points need to be discussed i guess uh, at these levels in in these meetings at these negotiating tables uh, so that the workforce and the public at large can at least be aware of the kind of situations they're getting into thanks anish for joining us uh, on daily debrief that's all we have on this episode of The Daily Debrief. But as always, we urge you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Uh, don't also forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice if you haven't done so already. And of course, even if it is Twitter. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another episode, same time, same place. Until then, stay safe. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.